Welcome to another episode of Fridays with Fawn. I'm Fawn Lopez, publisher emeritus of Modern Healthcare. Today, I'm talking with Nancy Agee, the CEO of Carilion Clinic in Roanoke, Virginia. Nancy, we've known each other a long time and our enduring connection has really enriched my life both personally, personally and professionally. I so appreciate your unwavering kindness and support over the year. Your exceptional leadership and dedication to um, patient and our industry have always inspired me. And your compassion towards your, your patient is just amazing and truly admirable. And so it's a truly a privilege to um, have you as my guest on Fridays with Fawn today. Gosh, thank you so much. What It is a privilege for me just to spend time with you. And uh, I'm very honored to be asked to do this. It'll, it'll be, I think, a fun 20 or 30 minutes. Um, but I have to say to you, Fawn, that you have just been uh, an iconicist uh, leader and somebody who I've followed from the very first time I, I got into administration, frankly, and I started reading Modern Healthcare and I'm thinking, who is this fantastic woman? I want to get to know her better. And I've followed your career. You've meant so much to, to healthcare in America. I can't even talk about how um, significant all the, the many things that you've done and leadership that you've provided. So thank you very much on behalf of all of us in the industry. Thank you. That that was just so kind. Thank you so much. I, I deeply appreciate your kind comments and, and the feeling is mutual. Um, Thank you. Truly admire you. All right, so let's get started before we, we get emotional. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's talk about your career, right? Okay. You started your career with Carillion as a nurse and you have remained with the system throughout your entire career. Can you tell us about your journey from serving as a clinician to leading Carilion Clinic. Oh, it's a long, it's a long story made short. And that is, I think I may have been in the right place or the wrong place uh, at the right time or the wrong time and just took on more responsibility. But, but I'll say a little more about that. I, I um, you know, frankly, I was born at our uh, flagship hospital. And it wasn't a flagship hospital at the time. It was a tiny little hospital that's now a 725-bed um, level one trauma center, high-level NICU, all of that. But at the time, it was a tiny little hospital, and the name of the hospital was the Crippled Children's Hospital. And I tell that story because the polio epidemic really started about 40 miles up the road in a small town called Withful. And... Uh, in the you know late 40s early 50s we were overwhelmed with children with polio and the hospital actually renamed itself the crippled children's hospital which is which was on my birth certificate um and, and that's a really important story because i'm proud of our organization for evolving and changing to meet the needs of those that we serve throughout its history and so yeah i started my career actually as a candy striper um, and then when I became a, a nurse, I um, worked here, I worked at our flagship hospital. We have seven hospitals now, a much larger footprint. But, uh, but back then, I, I, um, I was a med surge nurse. I loved what I was doing. I loved working with patients. I mostly worked evening shift, and I, I really liked that. But over time, I, um, got, I think I got frustrated with some of the policies and procedures for caring for patients. And I, I became a little bit of a rebel rouser with why don't we have the kitchen open longer for my patients that need nutrition in the middle of the night? You know, why, why this, why that? And, and I guess at some point someone said, if you can do it better, why don't you take this job more or less? And so I, I moved into some management positions um, and uh took on more responsibility and moved into some other management positions. And, you know, I think that uh, a good story is that people saw in me perhaps what I didn't see in myself. And I had great mentors, uh, both uh, male and female, 
who encouraged me and um, annoyed me and needled me and said, you can do more. And, you know, what about this? What about that? And so well, I became the chief operating officer of the organization. And uh, when the CEO uh, left, the board asked me to step in. So I didn't really apply for the job. I, in fact, I said, are you sure? Do you know what you're doing? Um, that was a dozen years ago, and uh, we've been through a lot since then, but um, yeah, it's been a, a terrific career, and I'm very grateful for all the opportunities that I've had. So the reason I felt such a connection to you when we first met was that, that story about the, the hospital and um, treating polio patients. One of my sisters um, has had polio when she was two years old. So I, I believe I shared that with you. So um, the career that you have had, that you have at um, Carillion, what made you want to stay at Carillion? And this, aside from people believing in you and you know wanting to just make changes, what prompted you to continue to seek leadership roles? So, uh, I remember, do you remember when you would do milestone things? So, you know, you get your one-year pen or your three-year pen. And back, mm -hmm. back in the day, when I got my three-year pen, we had it in the auditorium and the CEO passed out the pens and said nice things because it was just a handful of people that actually, you know, have much longevity. There was a woman who had a 30 year, got a 30 year pin. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, that woman is older than dirt. How, how would anybody <laughs> stay in an organization that long? And so it is a little bit disconcerting to me that so many years have passed. Um, but it's, uh, I love what I'm doing. I'm having, you know, I'm having a great time. Hard as it is, I'm having a great time. And I think that I, I teasingly say I'm not as boring as I sound. I do get out of town so, uh, sometimes. Um, but, you know, I, I, uh, I love what we do. And I believe in our mission. Uh, I believe in the mission of a not-for-profit health system. I believe in caring for those we serve. And I love this region. We call it urban Appalachia. It's, uh, you know, very rooted here. I have family here. And I think over time, one thing happened and then another, you know, I, I got married and then I had a child and we um, grew our family here. And uh, it, it, it was so synergistic that the place I love and the people that I love and the work that I love all happen to be located in the same place. Yeah, you're very, very lucky, fortunate. So how has how have your priorities as CEO of Carillion Clinic evolved over the past decade? What do you see as um, the system's biggest challenges over the next few years? And what are some of your biggest hopes for the future? You know, I think as the CEO, um, when you're first the CEO, you're thinking of you, you, you dive deep and hard into the organization. And I, I think get it in, in shape the way that you think it ought to be. It's never perfect. And there's always that journey. But I, I would say over the in recent years, over the past 12 years, priorities do change. For one, you began thinking about uh, a legacy. you you, we're very much more focused on succession. So how do you bring folks along and, and being much more intentional about that? I think secondly, as the largest employer west of Richmond, Virginia, we have a, a strong role in economic development for our region and getting more involved in um, external things, both at the, at, the come, at the level of the Commonwealth, but also in the region uh, for growing the economy for being a, a voice uh, across the business community, the business climate, being involved in higher education. You know, we've created several important partnerships 
that are public-private partnership, one with Virginia Tech to develop a medical school and a research institute, one with Radford University, another private, I mean, another public school where we developed a public-private partnership to, to grow um, uh, nursing education and health careers. So, so I think it's changed and you know, the priorities have changed. When you ask about the challenges going forward, it won't surprise anybody. Uh, labor, labor, labor. So having the talent that we need. And, you, you know, I, Fawn, perhaps you and I have talked about this. We knew there was going to be a nursing shortage prior to the pandemic. In fact, many of us were engaged in developing the pipeline, creating more educational opportunities and so on. Because back in the early 70s, when women more traditionally went into roles like nursing, you know, things opened up. And I'm super grateful for that. But people started going into other careers than nursing. And so we knew that as these baby boomers aged and began to retire, we were going to have a shortage. Well, we do. And of course, that was accelerated by the pandemic. So, uh, so I think high on my list in terms of challenges will continue to be labor, talent, and, and we're not going to ever have enough people. And so I think the, the secondary uh, challenge is how do we do care redesign? How, how do we incorporate artificial intelligence, other technology, so that we're not quite so reliant on people, but we're still able to provide exceptional care with good quality, with patient safety, and, and enhance the patient experience, improve access. So access is another one. I, I'm very concerned. It's not just a shortage of nurses, but a shortage of all sorts of providers. And so how do we improve access um, for, for a community, at least ours, it's an aging community. When you, you um, I think that's going to be true across the board and we have more and more healthcare needs. How we, can we improve access, provide an exceptional patient experience with high quality and, and with safety? Um, I would say um, financial recovery for us is very, uh, very much front and center right now. Uh, and it's going to get harder and harder, I think, to have a, a significant margin in, um, in, our, in our community, at least. Um, and we need that financial recovery because we're going to need significant dollars to invest in technology. And so it's a bit of a chicken and the egg, isn't it? So you're going to push hard on talent and on care redesign, but you've got to have the financial wherewithal in order to do all the things that you want to do. Um, so those are just some a few things on my mind. You know, worry about 340B. I worry about uh, payer relationships. I worry about where's Medicare going. I'm worried about Medicaid. But in general, I, I, I would say we are focused on care redesign, use of technology, and importantly, our talent. So you have a more than a full plate, um, which is, you know, I so admire healthcare uh, leaders, CEOs, um, healthcare CEOs for the work that they do, because you, you have to juggle so many different priorities. Um, so thank you for all that you do. The, um, we'll talk, I'd love to hear about your hopes. Uh, what are some of your biggest hopes for the future uh, of Carilion Clinic and the healthcare industry? As a whole. Well, you know, despite talking about what the challenges are, um, I, I'm just, I'm incredibly excited, even buoyed by where the industry's going. And I say that because we're paying attention to important things, health equity, social determinants of health, things that we really never thought about before. We were laughing the other day about, you know, central lines and how we used to have central line infections and now it's just not acceptable. Things we accepted before were, um, we can't do that. We, we've got to look very focused on quality and patient safety and the, the provider experience, the caregiver experience, but uh, we're doing it. And, uh, you know, I, I'm obviously concerned about our, the well-being and, and the, so the burnout, but, um, but I, I tell you, when I make rounds, when I talk to our staff, um, 
people believe we're doing the right thing. And so I have great hope for our industry. I think we're very focused on all the things that matter. I'm really excited about new medications, about new devices, new procedures. Um, I think we'll move a lot more care outside of the hospital four walls, and that's so much better for patients over time. So we have, you know, anesthetics that are short acting and safe to do outside of the hospital. We have more procedures with robots. Um, it, it, it's it's an incredibly exciting time. I, you know, just keeping up with some of this is uh, is challenging. Awesome. I think, you know, cobots, robots, um, artificial intelligence, where we're going with chat GPT and so on, all have uh, concerns, of course. We have to be wise about this, but great opportunity for improving care. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with you. So you talked about this earlier. Um, the system includes hospitals ranging from large medical centers to small rural and community hospitals. How do you ensure that all the patients you serve has have access to the same quality of care, regardless of where they live? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and, and we do have hospitals in rural areas. We have critical access hospitals. We have the third largest hospital in Virginia. So we have a, we, in our little system, we look like everything across, uh, across America. Um, we also have about 300 locations that are physician practices, provider practices, retail pharmacies, you know, all, all those sorts of things across a, a very wide footprint three helicopters. Um, we are uh, engaged in a lot of uh, ambulances and transport, a children's hospital, behavioral health. I mention all that because those are, those are things that we've done to improve access and quality of care across the system. And we've been more intentional about that. So we um, understand that not everything has to happen in the four walls. So we nurture those hospitals significantly, but we're also looking for ways to provide care. Telehealth's been a, a real asset to us. So we, we began telehealth, particularly for behavioral health and uh, neuro, uh, neurology and pediatrics. Uh, we have a lot of uh, telehealth associated with our emergency medicine departments. And we're finding that people love telehealth. They respond well to it. Uh, so I think that's an opportunity. The other thing that we do, you know, you talk about credentialing in the hospitals. So the, the medical staff get credentialed in all of our hospitals, of course, but we have a, a separate credentialing process so that all of our physicians, whether they work in an ambulatory setting uh, or in the, in the hospitals themselves, we go through a very significant credentialing process so that we can assure quality across the organization. I think the other part is that um, we look at what do, what does a community need. So our, our um, community assessment is very important. And then how do we hire for that? We have uh, a very robust graduate medical education program. And as part of our scorecard, we intend to hire 50% of our graduates and uh, we're there. And so, you know, we want to grow our own. Uh, but we also know that people who are here want to understand the, the, I guess you'd say the protoplasm, the kind of care that, that our patients need. And uh, so we, do, you know, we try to be much, very intentional about providing quality of care across the organization, regardless of what the site is. That's great. So um, the next question is about board services. Um, I know board service is an important part um, of your uh, career, including your service to the American Hospital Association Board of Trustees and as, if your role as past chair. What perspectives have you gained from your board service? And what are some of your proudest accomplishments as a board uh, uh, chair of the AHA? A past board chair. Yes. Um, you know, I'll tell you, one of, one of my uh, greatest privileges was to serve on the board of the American Hospital Association and then to be 
chair was r really just a phenomenal experience uh, for in, in a couple of ways. One is you you worked with this amazing group of people, very dispersed uh, or disparate, and, and brought different points of view, uh, which is our industry is big and broad, and we need lots of thought and lots of ideas. The other piece of that is that almost every week I was going somewhere across this great nation um, learning about what other health systems were doing, what other CEOs were doing, what the challenges were, and I could bring all that back to my organization. So, boy, that's a, a, a great help. I think my uh, my folks would get really tired sometimes when they knew I was going because I'd be, you know, on the phone saying, are we doing this? Are we doing this? What about this idea? Talk to this person. And the connectivity was fantastic. Um, so it was a great privilege. And, you, you know, I, I think if you ask me what was the, the, the thing I'm most proud of, of what we accomplished, it might be our focus on three things. One was access. So we, we really spent a lot of time talking about access uh, and how we could improve access. Secondly was cost. And so uh, value-based care was very important to me. And for, I guess, the last 14 years, I've spent a lot of time talking about medical debt, uh, how the cost of health care interferes with people seeking health care, getting the care they need. And so value-based care is very important. This is still troubling. We haven't solved it. But we are talking about it, and I think that was relatively a new conversation when I was chair. And then lastly, um, a, a real focus on social determinants of health, which I think in some ways has evolved to health equity and a deeper understanding of inequities in health care and what can we do about that. Those would be, I think, the things that I gain the most or, and the most proud of for the American Hospital Association. I also serve on several for-profit boards and not-for-profit boards now, and each of those has brought more broadly uh, a, a level of information, education, and experience that I've been able to bring back to our organization. And, and um, I, I tell you, I, I find those experiences enriching, challenging, interesting, uh, for my for-profit board, especially a bank board, I have to have to remind myself of a lot of math, <laughs> um, and that's a good thing, you know. That that keeps you that keeps you alive. Um, yeah, so definitely. I, I really encourage people to be involved in boards or committees. You know, or you know, getting that whole network is pretty important uh, experience for someone and and very enriching expanding your perspectives. Yeah. So what advice do you have for um, women who are looking to take um, the next step in their healthcare career? And what is your advice for um, organizations that want to improve gender equity and help women grow and succeed? So my advice for women is lean in, put yourself forward. I'm always a bit surprised when women hold themselves back. And if you walk into a room where there's, you know, where there are men and women, often it's the men who hold their hand out first, who introduce themselves, who have that elevator talk, and women stand back. And I, I, I think that's a mistake. I think we need to put ourselves forward and that takes a little practice, might feel uncomfortable. It's okay. Practice. Uh, you have a lot to say. And I think we're eager to hear from, you know, from people. So, so believe that, have some confidence that you're, what you have to say is important. Lean in, find opportunities. Uh, sometimes, you know, it may be, I don't know if I, if, if I have the experience, somebody else is smarter than me. That's probably not true. And, uh, you know, so raise your hand and, and take advantage of the opportunities. For me in my career, if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be where I am. And um, it's, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of opportunity out there. There's many things that you can do. And I think, as we talked about at the beginning, part of why I took this leadership journey was I was frustrated that I wasn't getting what I wanted for patients. 
well, gosh, there's a lot of people that know how to do things better than I do or anybody else does. You know, make make your make yourself heard. Um, so lean in is probably the key piece, I would say. And then um, in terms of what leaders should do for gender equity, I'll tell you, I, I used to be very proud of the fact that I was agnostic to, you know, to color, to gender, to whatever. And I've decided that I need to be much more intentional about um, women and bringing women along. And so, uh, and, and that, that's important advice. You, I don't think you can just be agnostic, although that's a step up, that's not sufficient. Mm -hmm. And so I, I find myself doing things like mentoring people, finding, uh, looking for women who, um, who want to give opportunities to. And I, I think that makes a difference. Um, so. Thank you. Great advice. And I've, you've always been um, a mentor to me. So thank you mm -hmm. for setting such great yeah. examples. Thank you. So let's talk about your career, um, going back to it. Um, what has been the biggest uh, success in your career? And what has been the biggest challenge or obstacle that you've had to overcome? Oh, gosh. So, uh, you know, we've talked about a couple of things. Certainly chairing the American Hospital Association was a huge highlight of my career. Um, I, you know, I, I think when you've been doing things as long as I have, you um, begin to wonder, did you make a difference? And I've had the great good fortune of hearing from colleagues and friends about what a difference you've made. And just recently I had a letter from someone who said, uh, you said something to me and I want to tell you what you meant to me. And the, the comment was, uh, you saw in me something 25 years ago and you suggested I do something and look where I am today. And does that matter? Well, I think for me, those are the biggest successes, that somehow you've made a difference in people's lives, whether it's our patients or our staff, uh, and, and that's very gratifying. So I would really call that my biggest successes. Obstacles, well, let's be honest, I'm a woman. <laughs> and for many, many times in my career, I'm the only woman in the room. Yeah. And that's not completely gone away. Um, and so, uh, putting yourself forward, um, preparing, making sure your voice is heard, having the confidence to do that isn't easy okay. and it's still not easy. Um, but that, you know, but that's a reality. Uh, so I, I think that is an obstacle. I'll tell you a funny story. And this goes back quite a while. I, when I finished graduate school, I came back and I was invited by the hospital administrator to provide a retreat for the leadership. And he, he suggested that I come to the board meeting and present this leadership conference we were going to hold. So, um, so I put on my red power suit and my high heels and I went into this, you know, paneled room. And everybody looked up at me and one person said, girly, I think you're in the wrong room. Oh, seriously, wow. it was just a room full of men. I, uh, that was the board at the time. Oh. And, you know, I said, uh, well, actually, I, I'm here too." And I, I went on with my presentation, but I'll have to tell you, when I left that room, my knees were shaking. Um, and I'm glad to say that now I chair that board. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, good for you. Gosh, I could not, I just can't even imagine that. Um, but, you know, I've, I've, True story. I've experienced a few uh, 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 stories myself. So let's mm -hmm. talk about your inspiration. Who has inspired you and um, to be a leader and, and, and why? Um, would you be willing to share? Sure, absolutely. Uh, easy answer, my grandmother. So um, 
my parents were um, young, very young. My mother was a teenager when she had me. We lived with my grandmother. And so I was very close to her. And she, she was an amazing person, um, widowed early, had four children, and she had to go to work. And she ended up managing a large grocery store. Uh, and she, she just, uh, she had so much fun. She had such a, 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 a liveliness about her. She, um, she loved to dance. She loved to play cards. She, um, she worked really hard. And uh, she always told me, you can do anything you want to do. You can be anybody that you want to be. And I expect you to make something of your life. Um, and so, you know, I think she'd be very proud to know what, where my career took me. Um, so she was definitely my inspiration. I know she's proud. She's beyond <laughs> proud. Thank you. Thank you. What advice would you then give your younger self um, about leadership or the journey to career satisfaction? So I think, I think my um, advice to my younger self would be get over yourself. You know, it's, um, gosh, I remember as a, a young person, everything seemed so important. Yeah. And there was a fair amount of, I, I guess you'd say drama. It was all manufactured. Uh, I didn't need to be so worried about things. Um, it, it, it's really, you know, it, things are going to unfold just fine. And I, I think the other thing, you know, I've talked a lot about confidence and putting yourself forward. I wish I could have told myself that back then. Uh, it took me a while to, um, you know, to, to gain my footing. And uh, so, I, you know, I think, get it, you know, get over yourself. You, We have a saying around here, um, take your work seriously yourself, not so much. That's a great, great, great thing yeah. to remind yourself of. Yeah. That's awesome. So um, you talked about legacy and uh, creating uh, a succession planning plan. What, would, what do you want your legacy to be at the end of the day? Yeah, gosh, I think at the end of the day, um, I, I hope that my legacy would be that I made a difference for our region. I cared about patients and um, I cared about our staff. And I, I hope that would be my legacy. Nancy, thank you so much for um, the time and, and the perspectives that you shared with us. And it's been such an incredible um, honor to uh, to have you on on uh, as my guest today um you're, you've again um uh, just want to say you've been such an inspiration to me and so many others uh and i hope you you know that that's part of your legacy well thank you so much and thank you for doing fridays with fawn uh, i'm enjoying that they continue to be an inspiration to me as you always have been so thank you fawn Thank you. And, and to all of our viewers, um, big thanks for tuning in. Your support means the world to us. As always, I look forward to seeing you on the next Friday uh, with Fawn. And I also hope to see you at the upcoming Women Leaders in Healthcare Conference, August 9th to 11th in Chicago. Until then, be well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.